Good evening. It is now uh, 6.30 and it seemed to me that we ought to begin and people who are joining are very welcome. We will make presentations in uh, strict order uh, to a limited time and therefore we hope at the end to be able to take people's questions. If you want to ask a question, could you please either use the question and answer facility or the chat facility and I will um, read out the question and ask one of the panelists to answer it. This uh, webinar, uh, and I will introduce the panelists just before each speaks, is the fourth in the series that is being uh, put on uh, by the European Law Institute about the principles uh, that it uh, devised and set out in relation to the issues that have arisen as a result of the COVID-19 emergency. And tonight we intend to concentrate on four of those principles. The first, principles three and four, which I hope are being displayed for you, really relate to the importance uh, of ensuring that democratic government and particularly the position of the uh, legislator was maintained. There always is a risk, uh, as you can see uh, from principle four, which is I think now in front of you, principle three and principle four. There was, it was seemed to those that drafted this, a risk uh, that the executive would take too much power and, and subvert ordinary uh, principles of, of parliamentary and legislative government. The fifth principle, which will be the centerpiece of what we want to talk about, uh, deals with the justice system and, and the importance of the courts being able to function as well as is practical. And we will each speak uh, a little about that. But we also took the view that it was important that we should uh, pay particular regard to disadvantaged people, such as prisoners and others, and also that although administrative sanctions were necessary, uh, there should be a proper means of judicial review. And finally, and this is pertinent to say at this present time, it is very important uh, that when we return to normal, we return to the rule of law as it has existed, and that any of the benefits or legislative uh, measures that have come out of it that are thought to be good are, are properly uh, enacted by Parliament in a considered way. Now I was going to, in the two minutes that I intend to speak for, uh, say a little bit about the position in the UK. Uh, first of all, uh, th there have as yet been no decisions by the courts in relation to uh, challenges to the <coughs> state of emergency and the measures taken by the government. One has been launched and it's a fairly root and branch attack uh, upon uh, the <coughs> legality and proportionality of the systems. It's being pleaded out and I imagine it will come to hearing probably just before uh, the summer. Apart from that, uh, the activities uh, of the uh, police in particular have been subject to some scrutiny and, and recently our Crown Prosecution Service fulfilling the role of an independent prosecutor have been looking at the justification for certain of the actions taken by the police and therefore one of the principles we highlighted the importance of a of review of administrative actions is underway but i think what has been of great interest in the uk but i don't intend to say much too much about it is the highlighting the principle of the rule of law uh, the, you may well have all read about the advisor to the Prime Minister who uh, took a, a journey uh, <coughs> away from London and people questioned was this in accordance uh, with the rule of law in the sense that was he who was one of the principal draftsmen subject to the rule of law, uh, <coughs> were the regulations sufficiently certain uh, he he uh, put the view well, what he did was perfectly okay, and is there equality before the law? 
Uh, whether there was or not will obviously be a very controversial matter, but for anyone interested in the legal system, I think it is very important. Finally, just a word about technology. Uh, the UK ha has been very fortunate in that it had taken some way uh, to putting in place good technology and it has proved surprisingly effective. I think what is important for the future is to review coldly and calmly what are the areas where we can go on using technology, what do we have to take particular care of, particularly those who need legal advice or, or may uh, be under a disability. And finally, we've got to work out what is it you can do remotely online and what is it you need an oral hearing. And one of the obvious areas in the UK where there is discussion is do you need to have witnesses present to question them? And of course, how do you conduct a jury trial? It will be very interesting to see how all of this uh, pans out. Now, it's, it's uh, um, having made those few introductory remarks, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Bruno Lasserre, the Vice President of French uh, <coughs> Conseil d'Etat, who is going to speak to us about, about his perspective on these issues from France and the Conseil d'Etat. Uh, Bruno Lasserre. Thank you very much, uh, John, and uh, I am delighted to join this uh, webinar this evening, and I hope the, the following discussion uh, will be lively and uh, stimulating. It happens in a very, I would say, relevant um, moment and in line with the ELI principles we just um, quoted. Uh, before we begin, I think it's useful to recall the French Conseil d'État has two main functions. It operates as an independent legal advisory body to the government and sometimes the parliament and at the Supreme Court for administrative matters. That being said, I will try to briefly explain what's been going on here since the, the crisis uh, broke. The last three months have been uh, roughly divided into two phases, I would say. The first one beginning in early March uh, with the lockdown and the second one beginning early May with what we all hope is the beginning uh, of the end or the transition to, to the end. During the first phase, France went through an extraordinary uh, period during which the rule, of, the rule of law has been put to the test. The, the parliament and the government have taken two main types of measures, some aimed at managing our country's activities, others at limiting the propagation of the virus. First of all, the parliament adopted a legal framework extending the powers of the government, the so-called health state of emergency law, which was passed on March the 23rd, uh, allowed the government to issue secondary legislation to regulate, anticipate and remedy multiple issues linked to the crisis. And roughly 50 pieces of secondary legislation have so far been issued in fields as diverse as labor law, civil and criminal law, education, banking, on consumer protection, and we were consulted on each piece of legislation. The government also took regulatory measures within the range of its own authority. It imposed a lockdown that proved, in my view, stricter than in the UK, but slightly more lenient, I would say, than in Spain or Italy. Within this context, the Conseil d'État quickly mobilized to protect the rule of law and reconcile rights and freedoms with the, necessary, the necessity to protect the, the population's health. Uh, with regard to our organization, the Conseil d'État activated um, its continuity plan, which had been defined and approved a few months ago. Judges and staff were asked to work from home unless their presence at the workplace was deemed essential. We made an extensive use of our digital tools, which were soon upgraded and made available for all. With regard to our advisory uh, role, 
our activity has been very, very intense. Uh, we held sessions nearly every day and examined about 150 drafts. Most of the recommendations we issued to improve the quality and the legal consistency uh, of the draft text were taken into um, account. With regard to our judicial activities, we immediately decided to postpone hearings that were not urgent. A task force of approximately 15 senior judges was constituted to hear urgent cases, most of which were linked to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, about, and it's a huge flow, about 160 claims to be judged through urgent proceedings were brought before us, and this is of course a lot more than usual. But what struck us most was the diversity of things that complainants were individuals, political parties, unions, um, uh, doctors, and uh, many, many other complaints requested. We were asked to act both as a judge and government, and even sometimes to arbitrate scientific controversies to define the rules needed to manage the crisis and at the same time to manage it ourselves. So some complainants requested that such legal text simply be annulled or suspended, and this is business as usual, but um, often others also requested that we order the government to take positive measures, which is much more difficult. As examples, we were asked to order the government to impose a stricter lockdown, to deliver masks to various professionals, to requisition a factory so that it produces medical gear, or even to nationalize companies involved in that business. We were asked to authorize the prescription of chloroquine by general practitioners. We were asked to release all illegal aliens from the centers in which they were held awaiting their expulsion. So those requests were based on fundamental freedoms, such as the freedom of movement, opposed to the right to health and the right to life. The latter have been proved particularly difficult to handle in the situation we were in. Another difficulty came from the fact that, to put it bluntly, the law doesn't say much about how to manage the shortage of masks or to resolve the strategic and organizational issues arising from an epidemic. Judges issued, and uh, that must be said, issued all their decisions in extremely short delays. In average, two or three days, and I'm very grateful to them. They did a fantastic job working day and night, hearing arguments and writing their, um, their, their decisions in a very, very constrained time. And I think we can already draw a few lessons from the way those cases were handled by the Conseil d'État. I will summarize them in four points. For, first point, our procedural tools prove perfectly adapted, provided we do not drift from our judicial job. As judges, we only checked the legality, necessity, proportionality, and adequacy of the governmental actions that were contested, that were challenged. In this regard, the framework of control we applied was all but new. I might add that the French government didn't seek the suspension of the European Convention of Human Rights so that claimants often invoked its provisions. Second point, the um, assessments made by the judges remain tightly linked to the risks existing on the very moment they took their decisions to rapidly evolving circumstances. and so did in our for restriction of freedoms. I agree vigilance know how to aid surveillance and restrictive measures
one must not illustrate this evolution of our jurisprudence once the lockdown was lifted. 18, the Conseil d'État ordered the government to lift its general ban on religious ceremonies. It found that this ban was incoherent, that rated the effects that on the freedom of worship was thus deemed disproportionate. But the Conseil d'État also made clear that religious ceremony rules governing any type of meeting. On the same day, the Conseil d'État ordered the government to immediately stop its use of drones to monitor rules put in place were being respected. The government Used, but the judge found that those drones were equipped with zooms that allowed for individual identification and that no rules had been devised to avoid the use of those data for other purposes than the what put forward by the government. First, uh, say, sorry, third lesson, we absolutely our this on our decisions. The media coverage gave us a very strong visibility and we have ever, ever been seen as, I quote, the arbiter uh, of the uh, lockdown. Today we had a hearing um, related to uh, the COVID-19 crisis. It was about the suspension of uh, football championship. championship. They were roughly uh, between 30 and 40 journalists attending the, 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 the hearings. That's huge. But as a matter of fact, the public and the media too often focus on the mere conclusions of those decisions. Do we accept or do we dismiss the case? But the truth is that there's much more than the conclusion in a judicial decision. And it is our duty to explain how we reached it. And that is all the more true that hearings have proved very effective, not only for judges to understand the whys and wherefores of the very difficult questions they were asked, but also to find solutions before they issued their decisions. Hearings often became the place where a solution was found, the judge's decision effectively becoming a hammer or a stick in case the government didn't show enough uh, good uh, will. The fourth conclusion, and I will accelerate in order to respect my time limit, the fourth point is about ex post evaluation. We're also committed to drawing more lessons from this period. A working group has been put in place to expect its conclusions to allow us to function even better in the future, in particular by our digital tools and deepening the alternative ways of doing justice we experience during the crisis. We plan on investing heavily in those digital tools and by keeping our community strong, even when its members are not present at the workplace. And the conclusions of the working group should also allow us to improve our continuity plan in anticipation of future crises. Just a word of conclusion, we are now back to normal. The judicial activities of the Conseil d'État are getting back to normal. Beginning May the, th the, the 13th, we are holding normal hearings on all substantive uh, matters. What's not back the, to normal, in the way we worked previously, most judges and staff will keep working from home and come to the workplace only when necessary. Uh, that said, appropriate measures have already been taken to resume all our operations and concerning our judicial activities, a piece of secondary legislation modified the rules of procedure to allow hearings to be partially held through video conferences. Judges can now participate remotely in hearings and deliberation. And in the same vein, in cases handled by a single judge, hearings can now be entirely held remotely. 
Um, it's very important because we're trying to guarantee a fair and impartial trial through innovative uh, methods. But I, I think it's important to uh, draw lessons from the, the, the crisis and to be sure that we'll function even better in the, in the, in the, in the future. I have not any time to develop that, but I will be delighted to answer questions. And I must apologize for having been maybe uh, a little too, too long. Thank you for your attention. Can I thank you very, very much of what uh, the Conseil d'Etat has been doing and how it's been uh, keeping uh, things very much under control. We now turn to Anne Virgit Gamelford, who's going, who's a member of the uh, executive of ELI, who has been president of the CCBE. Uh, and is a Supreme Court lawyer in Denmark to look at it from the profession's perspective. Thank you, very, thank you very much, John. I also listened very interesting to, to what uh, Bruno Zeresea was, uh, was telling us. It's, um, I come from a, a system where we, we do not have a... Con so the Danish government, uh, backed by all members of parliaments, uh, actually based on a very old legislation on um, epidemics, uh, made changes um, overnight actually uh, in mid-March and uh, they closed down um, the, uh, the country mid-March, uh, around the 12th of March, from one day to another with uh, very few hours uh, to go. And what happened there as a lawyer, we, we saw that the courts were closed immediately that has not been contested by by anybody it cannot under the Danish legislation be contested um, however the courts uh, were very um, uh, open to make sure that rule of law prevailed and that they had a proper administration as much as possible of justice but on the other hand as they could not gather as the court hearings could not go on uh, they could only do what they called emergency measures. So, of course, preliminary examinations in criminal cases were, were held. If you had to extend uh, time limits, uh, that could be done. Uh, certain services uh, were done, like injunction order, make uh, the courts understand that this was very urgent and it has to be done also some land registration where we have a very efficient um, uh, computerized land registration systems could actually work and function that was i think the only uh, thing which functioned perfectly uh, during the uh, the lockdown in solvency cases well only heard if uh, it was necessary to appoint a trustee uh, to uh, to take care of of the businesses to terminate employment contracts and uh, do something. Notarial deeds were not possible. People wanting to make wills uh, could only be done in a very old-fashioned way with witnesses, which is not something we, we do normally. So, so we had a, a period which was actually um, uh, quite strange. Um, then by end of April, uh, the courts, uh, with uh, the approval of the governments and the parliaments, started to reopen again and then of course at the time of reopening uh, a number of hearings had been uh, well terminated or postponed uh, without a definitive date the courts decided to, to look at that at first and um, then after that um, they were also very flexible and this very flexible on hours they they work on saturdays sometimes on sundays you can even uh, see them working in, in evenings if it's if it's necessary uh, and um, tomorrow as it is constitutional day which is normally a public holiday in Denmark uh, the um, the high courts and some of the uh, county courts will be working uh, not uh, the commercial court or not the uh, supreme court but the other courts uh, will, will be working and um, so, so that was uh, from a, a professional uh, point of view, we saw that only very few cases could be heard. And then of course we have a big lock, uh, backlog of cases uh, at the moment. Um, so 
I think from a from a, a Danish perspective, from a lawyer's perspective, um, we we now have to work together. We do that with the judges to try to see uh, if we can uh, make the cases uh, being heard as as quickly as possible. We have uh, furthered actually written pleadings, which is uh, makes it easier for the court to us. Then they can work also from home. Uh, and not only uh, when they are sitting in courts. Some of the problems we still have with uh, the courtrooms, uh, uh, and maybe that's not the same in other countries, but uh, we have a, a rule saying that only 10 uh, people uh, must gather uh, in, in an arrangement. That also applies for, for court hearings. And we have um, a minimum, uh, what you saw, square meters, allowed you have to have two meters between uh, people uh, in a room and uh, there has to be four uh, square meters per person in a room so many of, of our court rooms were actually not big enough um, if we, well the judges were not the problem because they're normally sitting um, way uh, up uh, but for the lawyers for their clients for the witnesses for the uh, journalists, because normally our hearings are public, uh, for people who want to come in and listen. Uh, in criminal cases, the courts have actually had to, uh, to uh, hire uh, facilities and uh, set up in, in such areas um, uh, court uh, proceedings and oral hearings. One thing which uh, this crisis has shown us, and I come from a country where we thought we were very advanced when it came to, um, uh, we, we thought, saw that the court, the systems of the courts were actually very old fashioned. Um, adequate uh, video conferencing systems in place. To, um, well, to work together with lawyers, they can work with uh, public prosecutors and they can work in some cases with, uh, with the, the with ordinary uh, Skype teams is not allowed. So access to, um, to, to actually appear uh, in a video conference uh, in, in front of, of judges uh, and with witnesses. So I think in the future, this is something which we will have to, to work uh, heavily on. Uh, and I think which has been we also have to uh, put in place now a kind of help packages for the judicial system so that we upgrade our judicial function uh, in, in the future if we have uh, to do another lockdown uh, maybe for a shorter period but uh, some people are of course saying that that could come again. Then for the cases now which are in, in, in a backlog we, we have a uh, a, a problem with uh, prioritizing the types of cases. As I said, uh, cases who are, were put on stop because you were in the middle of the hearing, they are being prioritized now and uh, are being heard and the courts are reporting that they have actually been able now to schedule and put in their calendars all the cases which were, were put on, 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 on hold. But then we have the criminal cases. We have a big problems on family law cases. Um, people who are waiting for divorces, children with custody, uh, maintenance cases uh, are uh, in deadlock. They are not in that sense considered um, uh, urgent. We have to look at, at uh, civil law cases. There are a lot of businesses who actually need to get their cases heard. And uh, then of course there are the insolvency and the enforcement uh, cases. And then one problem at least which we encountered in Denmark, we did find a solution to it, was payment of fees actually to lawyers assigned to represent accused or litigants in cases because normally they are only paid when the cases are, 
uh, uh, finalized, and they uh, do not normally be are not normally paid uh, up front or, or um, on an ad hoc basis. So there were a number of lawyers actually who nearly went bankrupt uh, when the case, when these cases were stopped and found it difficult to finance. Uh, but the 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 courts were very uh, very uh, good in that sense, at least in in uh, what I've heard. And they accepted to uh, to pay out based on uh, time spent uh, until uh, the court uh, proceedings were put on 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 a hold. For the future, as lawyers, um, uh, and I think Lord Thomas touched on that also, uh, with with uh, the litigation which was introduced in in Denmark, there has been a lot of uh, increase in fines and. Uh, administrative uh, uh, criminal sanctions and uh, these sanctions are in, in many cases uh, not what we normally see uh, in, in, in other uh, issues of, of criminal law uh, also in, 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 uh, if you are violating uh, civil law company laws and, and, and other kinds of laws and uh, so we, they have sunset clauses but we will definitely have to monitor in the future what happens when these sunset clauses uh, come into uh, to use. Because sometimes we see that there is a tendency from at least the side of politicians that once they have increased uh, the, um, the fines and the sanctions, it might have an impact actually on, on other kinds of laws for the future. So this is one of the things which are worrying. Uh, also, uh, the legal profession and and the lawyers. So I think actually this is what I would uh, bring about from from a Danish perspective. Thank you very very much indeed, Anne Birgit. And now we turn next and finally to Ole Berger, a judge in the Higher Regional Court, Germany in Bremen. And we'd be very uh, look forward to seeing the perspective that he has as a German judge. Thank you, yes. Lord Thomas, and um, good evening to everyone. As I said, the mute button is still a riddle to me. In my short remarks, I want to cover the experience which we hear in the German court system had with the pandemic and the lessons which we are currently learning from it. And as I guess, as in most countries, we had so far two distinct phases of the effects of the corona pandemic on the court system. The first phase started with the beginning of social distancing measures in Germany in mid-March and led to widespread closures of courts to the public and only an absolute minimum of proceedings continued to take place. And this lasted for some four to five weeks and as from the end of April, courts are now operating at a somewhat fuller capacity under what are still crisis conditions, which will probably continue to apply for some time to come. And this crisis regime seeks to take account of the risk of the pandemic and the need for social distancing or safe distancing but um, also aims to guarantee that everybody a right to a fair trial and protected by the courts or to the extent possible under these conditions. We look at um, civil cases first. The legislature has enacted emergency legislation covering issues of substantive civil law, but there has not been yet any emergency legislation concerning issues of civil procedure. So courts more or less have to develop the rules for themselves within the existing framework here. Primarily, courts and judges are trying to deal with the situation by reorganizing the work. A case has been prioritized and primarily urgent matters have been heard. And the time that has thus become available has been used for the work on backlog of cases that often do not require an oral hearing, such as cases, their decisions and judicial process. Similar. And probably the most important development here is that um, judges practice safe distancing by working from home which often involved considerable investments by the courts in portable computers and secure internet connections for home office use, which are very useful. Courts themselves have then been very flexible in extending or suspending deadlines and time periods in civil law cases, but as I said, this was not done on the basis of general legislative action, but rather on a case-by-case -case basis on the basis of individual decisions by each court or judge. And the same applies to protective measures that are used in order to ensure safety and the safety and protection during trials. 
here individual courts have come up with a wide ranging field of solutions which are not always in line with each other. So some courts are working on the introduction of glass separators or they're moving to bigger rooms. But obviously the most relevant question is whether or not to require the use of face masks. And here the issue is disputed. So some first instance, first instance judges have required participants in the trial to wear masks, whereas others have taken the opposite approach and, and prohibited the use of masks in the courtroom. So as of yet, I'm not aware of any appeal court decision on this matter, but it's some, surely something that, um, that should be harmonized at some point in time. And, um, Another question which is also very central to the BLI principles and which we've just heard about from the French and Danish perspective is whether oral hearings can be replaced by other proceedings. Now first, the German Civil Code of Procedure allows the possibility of proceedings conducted entirely in writing and this is a technique which is used more frequently in this crisis but it's not a perfect remedy. It's dependent upon the consent of the parties and obviously it doesn't really work where there's a need to hear a witness. And the second alternative possibility would be hearing cases by video link. And uh, the code provides for such a possibility. But again, it's um, far from perfect as a tool to be used in pandemic situations. The main flaw is that um, while the parties may be allowed to participate remotely, judges still have to be in the courtroom. And parties and uh, the general public are still free to attend there. And, even though also even though this possibility exists in the code court the uh, code sorry most courts do not have the technic necessary technical equipment to use um, video link conferences our computers do not have webcams normally they're mostly for security reasons and there are also unresolved matters um, concerning the security of the remote link because generally there's a prohibition of um, broadcasting and videotaping proceedings and this is, of course, rather difficult to enforce when you're uh, using a video link. And, and those courts that do apply such remote links then also have some use of some of the commercially available video conferencing options, but um, there's as of yet not a really court-specific solution here. Moreover, of course, as has already been mentioned, video proceedings have other limitations as well, because quite often it's the immediate impression of a person that is decisive, and this is something that's rather, rather difficult to achieve when you're using a video link. Also, I would say, say um, when you're trying to negotiate a deal between the parties, it's probably much more efficient to have all the parties present in the room than rather than trying to get them to a some common solution if you're just seeing on the on his computers. Another question which has not been discussed actually widely in Germany is whether if the court still sees a need for oral proceedings, whether the pandemic may be a legitimate basis for parties to refuse to appear in the courts. Obviously allowing the parties not to appear could endanger the proper conduct of proceedings and the other party to a transaction without court protection. So therefore in accordance with the principle that a minimum level of operation should be maintained, the epidemic should not generally give a right not to appear in court. Of course, where a party is actually ill or under quarantine orders, this is a reason not to appear. But um, the general rule on safe distancing is not, even though it seems that um, I've heard that some, some airlines <laughs> have sought to use this argument against having to defend themselves against claims under the EU passenger rights regulation in the night. So still, um, people might be afraid of venturing in a public place as a court, but the Constitutional Court even has held that the mere fear of an infection such does not give a reason not to appear. However, it is provided that the court itself does apply reasonable measures to protect the party's health, such as by distancing measures in the courtroom. This, if this would not be provided, then actually there might be a reason not to appear. So, so much for civil law, turning now to criminal law cases. There has been some emergency legislation concerning the rules of criminal procedure. And here the, the maximum period allowed for a suspension of hearings before the trial must start anew has been extended. And this should allow for disturbance arising from safe distance measures, even where there's no party individually affected by sickness or quarantine. Apart from that, however, the tools to deal with the emergency are very, very limited in criminal law cases. In criminal cases, apart from rather minor cases, there's really not really a possibility for proceedings without oral hearings. And as far as I see, that also has not been suggested to introduce such possibilities. Courts will prioritize their caseload and deal with more urgent cases first, 
but it, that is really all at all, all, all about that can be done here. And um, defendants and the lawyers and who quite often seek to raise a defense that they should not be required to attend court proceedings at the moment. But as I said, this defense has not been accepted by the constitutional court. The problem is then, in effect, that um, applying these safe distancing measures obviously reduces the court's capacity to deal with cases. You cannot deal with the same number of cases if you always have to look for the biggest room and have to keep a safe distance between all participants. And the argument has been, that has been raised that under such conditions, defendants should not be kept under pretrial detention and due detention during trial because due to the fact that these conditions are so extreme, detention might take much longer than compared to under normal circumstances. As of yet, this argument has been rejected, even by my court. Um, such detention during trial may not, um, may, not linger to, uh, may not take longer than absolutely necessary, but we also have to consider that trial judges are also responsible for the health and safety of the participants of the trial, and at least as long as they can show that they do all that they can to ensure that a speedy trial takes place, even to the extent possible under the safe distancing conditions, such detention will be upheld. But of course, there will be limits to that, and depending how long the situation will persist, and we might come into a situation where we have to think about the possibility of keeping people in pre-trial in detention during trial if we cannot really have trials at the normal speed. One final matter is then um, extradition. Here, really, the whole system has come to a standstill because you cannot extradite someone if there is no longer a rate of traffic and if the officials accompanying the requested person will have to go into quarantine upon their return to the requested country. In the European arrest warrant system, extradition normally has to take place within a very short time limit, but all this has been tacitly suspended. The question which arises here is then whether it should actually be allowed to take a requested person in detention if then the extradition itself will be postponed. Again, for the time being, the courts have allowed this, arguing that the standstill is not expected to take too long. But also here, we can expect that they will have to consider granting bail or requesting proof that the criminal investigations actually continue in the requesting country if this period takes too long. We will see for that. So in conclusion, what are the takeaways from my short overview? I think generally the German court experience very much confirms the contents of the ELI principles five. The courts have to ensure a minimum level of operation and proceedings via remote links could be developed to a solution and deadlines should be extended. And of course, whatever emergency measures applied should be time limited. There's also an idea in Germany of preparing a general legal framework for court proceedings under epidemic conditions, which would then apply obviously only for the next epidemic or for the next wave, but that would have to be properly discussed. And here, of course, the experience of other countries as well as the EII principles to be taken into consideration. Especially the possibility to use video link procedures should be extended, possibly even requiring all parties to participate remotely so as to protect against holdout situations that we currently have under the present system. What is needed also is the general framework on the conditions of conducting trials in person during um, epidemic emergency situations. As I said, this is currently left to individual judges but it would be very, very useful if they could, for example, get reliable advice on the use of masks or other protective um, equipment so as to harmonize the decisions here. It would also be preferable, of course, for the parties if the question of extension of, extension of deadlines is not a matter to be decided individually, but rather according to generally reliable criteria. And finally, of course, the current crisis has shown that even to the courts, finally, that efficiency gains are to be had from digitalization. So, we are to introduce electronic files anyway, but um, I think we have all learned now that we need to invest into the technical hardware as well to make the most out of these possibilities. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much indeed. And now can I go straight to some questions? The first one, which is asked by Judge Marc Clement, is this. What would be the main lesson to be taken for courts following COVID-19? what would be the priority in terms of development or reform to increase resilience and public service in the time of crisis? And I think this is a general question which would be quite useful to have everyone's answer 
And that gives me an excuse to answer at the end. So could I ask Bruno Lasser first what he thinks is the main lesson? You need to be unmuted. Do you hear me? Yes, now. Yes, thank you very much. Well, it's thank you for these fascinating questions, which is a very relevant one. I tried to summarize the, the, the main lessons we drew from the COVID-19 crisis. Um, I think first, um, as a, a, a judicial body, as a body specialized in reviewing public decisions, we must act in a way which is exemplar. Um, um, I think we had the duty of exemplarity um, and nobody would have understood that we close our activities. Um, we, we decided to focus on urgent matters and to hear immediately all the cases which were brought to us in link with the health uh, crisis. And what I tried to, to, to explain is that uh, we, we considered that the tools we had to hear and to deal with that cases proved uh, adapted to um, the present situation. Uh, in France, we have an emergency um, procedure which allows us to impose public authorities any uh, injunction, any order in the case where there is a situation of emergency first and second conditions when uh, there is at stake a hurt of um, and a serious and uh, manifest hurt to a fundamental uh, freedom. And what I explained is that uh, happily we had uh, in our hands that emergency uh, procedure which proved very, um, very efficient and very um, relevant. I can't detail all the 160 uh, cases which were brought to us under this uh, procedure, but it, had, it allowed us to deal very efficiently and very uh, rapidly uh, the, the, the cases which were brought um, to, to, to us. Second uh, lesson, and I think it's important, it's good, of course, it's necessary not to close the business, to, uh, to issue uh, relevant and sounded uh, decisions, but it's even more important to explain what we are doing. And uh, personally, I found that need to develop pedagogy, to develop communication. We have never been in such a period where our press uh, staff, our press um, uh, service was so asked to explain, to explain how we function, how our procedures, uh, why we took that decision, in which context, what would be the consequences of what we, 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 we judge. And it has been fantastic. It has been an enormous and I would say wonderful opportunity to talk about the Conseil d'État, talk about administrative justice and how we can very practically do our job of protecting the rule um, of law. So um, my, my, my feeling is rather positive. We proved resilient, we proved mobilized, and we maintained a very strong link between us, between members and staff of the Conseil d'État, but between the Conseil d'État and the administrative tribunals and the appeal courts, um, which are under our review. And uh, I think that innovative methods uh, will be kept for, 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 the, for the future. So the main lessons um, uh, I, I, I would draw, um, uh, are those I tried to, um, to summarize um, maybe um, briefly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And Begit, do you have? Well, three? very brief. I think that uh, the main lesson we, we have learned is that we need to look at our uh, legislation again to make sure that we can actually uh, have uh, pleadings uh, with video conferencing uh, systems. Uh, we, we allow that in, in certain uh, criminal law matters 
uh, but definitely not in, in civil law matters. The courts do not have the, um, the equipment, as I also heard from Germany. Uh, there are very few courts who, who have that. But, but again, then, um, so I think that's one uh, lesson to be learned that we have to look at the legislation to make sure that it's possible and under which conditions. And then on the other hand, we have to be very sure that we do not give in on administration of justice and the rule of law. Because um, in one way or another, it, it, there is a security issue. There is an issue of when you hear people pleading that um, it, at least I think I had one of the first cases which were pleaded uh, by video conferencing with a person um, who was sitting in Spain, could not leave Spain. Uh, and we have the judge uh, sitting in a courtroom and I was sitting uh, four meters uh, away from the judge and uh, the, uh, uh, the person in Spain's lawyer was also there but very far away. And, and we felt that it was actually a, a very strange position and not what we are used to. And, and we, we, the way you look at witnesses, the way you look at parties, uh, the way it's normally conducted uh, is, is it's not definitely that you come up with a feeling that you have the, the security that the pleadings are in, uh, done in, in, in the proper way. So we have to work on that. But that's what I think I would, we would take as a lesson from this. Ole. Yeah, thank you. Well, well, I would try to answer this question only from the court's perspective, so what the courts themselves could do. And I think one of the first and foremost things would be, um, would be necessary is really an investment in technology. And there have been so many courts where they don't have and didn't have any portable computers at all. It's certainly not for all um, judges. So this is something that should be prepared here. And apart from the technology, from the secure internet links, what we also probably what need is the preparation of rooms that could be used, that are big enough, that have necessary protective equipment to be used in epidemic situations. This is something which the courts um, should probably do some themselves. What we also, also would need probably is to prepare in advance some epidemic plans. We, we did this here like off the cuff in, 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 in mid-March and obviously it would have been better if we had this done earlier, if we had the opportunity to think about this earlier. And I think um, one other thing, and even if it's not done by the legislator, I think the courts the, themselves should communicate with each other to, to seek to come uh, to a, a harmonized solution on, on how to proceed with technology questions, how to proceed with preparation, and what a message to convey to the parties who are using um, the court system. And I think this is something which the, the courts themselves should um, would communicate with each other and come, try to come up with a, with a common solution to be presented to, to, the, um, to the public here. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just add an observation from the perspective of the UK? I think we're very fortunate, as I said at the outset, that the courts here have been able to function we got used to doing remote hearings and all our courts, save our jury trials, have really gone on pretty much as normal. Our rules are very flexible and we've made vast investment in this. Um, I was able to sit here like, like, you, like I am tonight and uh, we heard a case with the other judges of the Supreme Court scattered all over the UK and the parties and it, it, uh, it was a big and important case. And, and this has been the way in which um, the courts have proceeded. I think uh, it shows what can be done. But I think the uh, really important lesson from the UK's perspective is that there has to be an institutional way of challenging decisions made by the executive. You've either got to have a parliament that can meet, and there's a difficulty with that, in current circumstances, or you've got to have some <coughs> ability of the courts. And I found very, very fascinating Bruno Lasserre's description of the role of the Conseil d'Etat, because I think what may come out of this for countries that do not have a, a judicial institution or a parliamentary institution that has proved effective, uh, that the public will be very disillusioned that there was no one to question what the executive have done and particularly when the executive kept most of his advice until it's been uh, in, in the UK confidential to itself. So no one could really question whether the measures that the UK government took were in fact justifiable. 
And it's, I think, the great lesson we have to have institutions and rules in place that can question decisions. So, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add that, but can I turn now to the second question, which is a very short one, and it's to you, Ambegid. It is this, given the technological advancements, uh, can you see ways in which valid wills can be drafted in amendment without the need for physical presence before notaries and other matters of that kind? It, it's, I think it's a very, it, it's, yes, I, I think I can see it. Uh, if we can make it reliable and uh, make the, the filing in, in a way um, justifiable so that you know exactly which person is filing, um, the identity of the person and perhaps also uh, that it's not a robot or whatever and you will ask some questions uh, so you make sure that the person understands actually um, what is filing then perhaps in, in, in a number of years, we will be able to file that. We, we have a system in, in, in Denmark with um, powers of attorneys where you can actually make a filing if you uh, well, make a document and you can uh, file it with the, uh, a registration under uh, uh, the court registration services. Uh, and. Um, and, and, and that is done for, for the future, if for one reason or another you get senile or, or whatever, then that can be introduced. So it's a kind of a, a future uh, uh, power of attorney uh, to someone uh, if you are not able to, uh, to, to deal with matters yourself. And that is done electronically uh, nowadays, and, and uh, so that is possible. So I, I think it might be possible in the future. And then and the next question relates to a prioritization asked by Professor Pascal Pinochet. It asks, prioritization of cases seems to be crucial in most countries because of case backloads. Will this affect more, uh, more some types of subject matter than others, such as disputes over large contracts, which take up a lot of court time? If so, what's the solution? More judges, accelerated proceedings, extrajudicial measures. Can I just start with you, uh, Ole, uh, on this? Yeah, thank you. Well, well I, I guess um, courts will have to deal with the really urgent matters um, first, and um, so probably there might be a, a backlog, especially of the more complicated matters, which do not seem to require absolutely, which are not going to seem to be absolutely urgent. But however, then, um, every judge's experience with uh, difficult and, um, and, and large cases, typically, it doesn't get easier by the time. So, so um, if, if you wait too long, the case will get probably get more complicated. So um, every judge is well advised even to tackle the, the, the more difficult cases um, at some time. I don't, I don't really see that it's possible to, to um, have some accelerated proceedings to, to solve this question, especially if the problem really concerns the more, more complicated cases. So I guess it's just um, um, it's the question of when the judge will find the time. Um, whether um, it would be a solution to have more judges, of, of course, um, I would always be in favor of them having even more judges, but um, um, I don't know really um, what the fiscal position will be after this crisis and whether we will be able to um, pay for all these prices. So I think at the moment it would be premature to say that we are really on the way of um, having a big new intake and new judges who could be dealing with this backlog. Um, I think it will, to some extent, it will also um, depend on the lawyers who have then just do a large part of work here and try to do, and get these cases forward. But I don't really see that there will be a procedural sort of tool to deal with this problem. Uh, Ambigate, did you want to add anything to that? No. Um, Bruno said, did you want to add anything to that? Well, John, I'm not so pessimistic about our backlog. Um, because, as I tried to explain, we stopped our normal hearings mid-March, but we resumed them entirely um, mid-May. So, two months, uh, well, it's not enormous. And it's not enormous because in the same period, we had a strong decrease of the, I would say, the, 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 the entering flow, uh, because 
with the crisis, we have fewer uh, complaints, fewer cases. So I'm confident that at the end and in 2020, we'll be able to deal with his backlog in a smooth and effective way. I'm not pessimistic at all. And then we have, I think, just time for one final question. And it's this, is from Mustafa Abide. Is there a trend for a unified digital strategy in the European Union that provides the production development of technological tools and unified systems for use by a relevant institutions such as courts, so that costs are saved on the one hand and coordination and standardization of the information service is a one is a one time event. Um, and Birgit, can we start with you on this? Yes, uh, and my, my answer is I don't know. I, I haven't heard about anything which uh, should be a unified uh, EU uh, system. And I, uh, with my Danish experience on, on that uh, with, uh, within the EU, I don't think that will be possible because courts are working in, in very different uh, matter, ways. So I don't think that will be possible. But maybe there will be some some of the IT providers who will be able to put up a system which can then be uh, copied in, in other countries. Bruno, did you want to add anything on that point? Well, um, I'm not sure we need a unified European framework. We have so different legal and judicial um, well, situations, traditions, experiences that I think it will be very difficult to impose a unified standard. Uh, but what I think is necessary is the need to exchange between us, and the ELI is a fantastic workshop for that, to exchange about good practices, to learn from the others, and to share good practices in order to have a common knowledge. So the principles published by the ELI is a fantastic tool to stimulate each other, to exchange and to learn from, from, from other jurisdictions. So I would favor a more voluntary uh, approach like a club where members learn from others. Well, I couldn't uh, say anything as a more perfect conclusion to the, uh, this webinar than that. I think that uh, my own observations are two. First, uh, that the principles that were drafted uh, by Ely have proved when we look back to have been very, very important um, and very important for people to try across Europe to ensure that they were holding people to account and ensuring that the rule of law went on. On the much more specific technological question that's been asked, I think uh, that is much more a question for courts to consider. But if I may uh, just uh, take up uh, Bruno Asser's point, uh, there is an organization which is interested in commercial courts, the Standing International Forum of Commercial Courts, which has just published a sort of set of common uh, uh, <coughs> lessons to be learned with some explanation of what happens in a number of different jurisdictions, including France and the UK. And I think there may be something there that is of use, but I'd be astounded if judges could ever agree on the right technical solution to everything. But we have all very much agreed this evening on the importance of sticking to principles. I've been deeply impressed by what has been done in France and in Germany and in Denmark. I think what we've got to take away is have we got the institutions right? And France may have given us, if I may say that, as someone from the UK, an excellent uh, 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 introduction to the way to hold governments to account. Thank you very, very much indeed. And may I, on behalf of all the participants, thank each and every one of you for uh, um, uh, coming this evening and talking and giving us such an interesting seminar. Very, very many thanks indeed.